Hello, this is Dr. Conde. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Treva Throneberry? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Treva Throneberry was born in Wichita Falls, Texas, on May 18, 1969. Her father, Carl, and her mother, Patsy, had met in the early 1950s in Oklahoma. A few weeks later, they were ready to get married. They drove to an AMP supermarket in Wichita Falls. The butcher at that store was also a preacher. He married the couple in the parking lot as they sat in the back seat of Carl's car. Sounds pretty romantic. The smells of love and sides of beef were in the air. The couple would go on to have four daughters and one son. Treva was the youngest child. The family moved to Electra, Texas sometime later. Treva and her sisters were victims of an assault of a sexual nature perpetrated by their uncle. In 1985, 16-year-old Treva falsely claimed that her father committed the same offense. She was placed in foster care back in Wichita Falls, so she was in a different town than her family. Her foster mother reported that Treva would curl up at night in the corner of her bedroom with the sheets pulled over her head. Sometimes she would bang her head against the wall and say things as if she was pleading with an attacker not to harm her. After a few weeks, Treva started leaving notes for her foster mother, making references to eternal death and nihilism. Treva enrolled at Wichita Falls High School this is when she started telling stories about how Satan worshippers had kidnapped and assaulted her. In May of 1986, she was sent to a mental hospital. She would stay there for five months. She was sent there because she told a high school counselor that she wanted to harm herself. Mental health clinicians said that she would stare out of the windows, rarely eat, and she maintained a blank expression on her face. Some of them believed that she had a personality disorder. Her family came to visit her at the facility, but she refused to talk to them except to accuse them of not loving her. Around this time, the district attorney's office dismissed all the charges against her father, Carl. Treva was discharged in October of 1986. Her parents were not willing to take her back into the family residence until she admitted that she had falsely accused her father. With no place to go, she was sent to a residential treatment center in Fort Worth, Texas. She was enrolled in a nearby high school in order to finish her senior year. She graduated in 1987. Treva rented her own apartment in Arlington, Texas, and found work as a hotel maid. A few years after this, Treva started a journey that would last for about 10 years. She traveled to various parts of the United States and repeated a pattern of behavior that would feature various elements, including inventing an alias, trying to pass herself off as younger, claiming to have a history of being attacked by various groups of people, like Satan worshippers, and falsely accusing people of attacking her. Here are a few specific examples of her behavior. In 1992, when she was living in Oregon, she pretended to be a teenager named Keely Smith. She even tried to legally change her name. She once again falsely accused her father, and she said that he was a police officer, which he was not. In 1994, Treva surfaced in Idaho using the name Kara Davis. She relayed the familiar story of being attacked by Satan worshippers. Later that same year, she showed up in Plano, Texas with the same story, but a different name. This time she was Kara Williams. She was spelling Kara with a K at this point. In June of 1996, Treva was in North Carolina where she told the police that she was being chased by cult members from Texas. In August of that same year, she went by the name Stephanie Daniel Lewis and was living in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Her backstory was that she was being assisted by members of a religious underground who were trying to keep her away from the Satan worshippers. The police investigated for over two weeks and charged her with giving false information. She spent nine days in jail. Treva then went on to Louisiana, New Jersey, and Ohio before arriving in Vancouver, Washington in 1997. 
She was once again identifying as a teenager. She was 28 at this time, but pretending to be 17. She used the name Brianna Stewart. She had sex with a 47-year-old security guard and then accused him of assault. He pleaded guilty to communicating with a minor for immoral purposes and was sent to jail for 50 days. Later, when Treva was exposed as a fraud, the security guard's conviction was expunged. That same year, Treva continued to maintain the identity of Brianna Stewart when she enrolled as a 10th grade student at a high school in Washington. Her story at this time was that she was from Alabama and her mother had been stabbed to death by her stepfather. She left her stepfather and was searching for her real father. At one point, she moved in with a foster family. She falsely accused her foster father and was kicked out of the house. She graduated from high school as Brianna Stewart in 2000. Treva hired a couple of attorneys to help her get a new birth certificate so she could establish her identity as Brianna Stewart. The attorneys did not know about each other. The state of Washington eventually indicated that they would not oppose her petition for a new birth certificate, but she would have to appear at a court hearing near the end of March 2001. Before Treva could make it to that hearing, she was arrested for theft and perjury because she had lied about her age to stay in the foster care system. Many people had sympathy for Treva. Several came forward and said that she should be treated by mental health clinicians, not put in prison. What really hurt Treva is that she still would not admit her identity. She was offered two years in prison if she would admit that she was Treva, but she refused and maintained the Brianna Stewart story. She decided to take her case to trial and represent herself. I find it ironic that she chose to represent herself because the whole point of the trial was Treva trying to convince the jury that she was not herself. Whoever Treva was pretending to be, the person was not an effective attorney. She was found guilty. Treva was sentenced to three years in prison. She was released after two years and three months. Treva surfaced again years later, in 2016, when she was working in a hotel. She falsely accused a man there, as was her pattern. She was fired after her criminal history was revealed. Now moving to my analysis. When Treva was young, she was described as happy, shy, and as having a vacant look in her eyes. Her history of making false accusations started when she was young and persisted for many years in the absence of any clear motive. First, I'll look at a few items that stood out to me in this case, then offer my theory about what could have happened. Item number one, Treva had success by making up a tragic backstory. People would take her into their homes so she wouldn't have to sleep in the street or in a shelter. Her story about harmful Satan worshippers resonated with many people who were affected by the Satanic Panic. This was the cancel culture of the 80s and 90s. Item number two. When Treva was pretending to be Brianna at a high school in Washington, many people, including mental health clinicians, tried to help her find her father and get a social security number. Treva told them that this is what she wanted to do. They knew something was not right as far as her identity, but that was part of her story. She had amnesia. She really didn't know who she was, but she did know that she was not Treva Throneberry. Item number three, in high school, the second time, Treva participated in activities even though she was not good at them. For example, she was on the tennis team, but was the worst player by far. She was active in drama class, even though her acting skills were atrocious. She made Steven Seagal look like Peter O'Toole. Treva was several years older than the other students. It's not clear if she was truly poor at these activities or wanted to appear that way. Item number four, when she was arrested in Altoona, Pennsylvania, a mental health professional put her in touch with her parents. She denied that she was Treva Throneberry, even as she was on the phone with them. Interestingly, her father said that she would occasionally call the family residence and pretend to be somebody else. Treva's official story was that she was Brianna Stewart, but the DNA proved that she was Treva. Item number five, in cases like this, after the individual is exposed as an imposter, many people typically come forward and say something like, I always knew she was a fraud, it was obvious, I can't believe other people ever believed her. 
But in this case, we see something completely different. Everybody that she came in contact with thought that Treva believed she was actually Brianna Stewart. Mental health clinicians, lawyers, the police, everyone found Treva to be convincing and credible. They did not see any indication that she was lying, other than the fact that she was clearly not who she claimed to be. She behaved like somebody who really thought she was a teenager. She supplied her fingerprints to her attorney. She demanded that her DNA be compared to that of Carl and Patsy Throneberry. She accepted the help of people who were trying to find out where she was from. She made no effort whatsoever to hide her past. Rather, she caused her real identity to be discovered. Moving to the next question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. There have been many opinions about this case as far as mental health and motive. Maybe Treva had PTSD. She could have had dissociative identity disorder, DID, or dissociative fugue. Other people believe that she was simply lying. She must have met some type of need from perpetrating this fraud. The mental health explanations are not really satisfying. People with PTSD do not create multiple identities and pretend to be a teenager. With DID, in theory, somebody could have multiple personalities, but they would not express like what we see in this case. For example, Treva would adopt one identity for a few months and then change to another. She really wasn't moving through a number of alters within a day or a week, like we would expect to see with DID. Treva eventually settled on one particular identity. That's just not how DID works, if it is, in fact, even a real disorder, which is hotly debated. Looking at dissociative fugue, this one seems like a more likely explanation, but again, we run into some problems. For example, just like with DID, many clinicians do not believe that dissociative fugue actually exists. One of the symptoms of the disorder is an inability to recall autobiographical information. Treva made it seem as though she couldn't remember her past when she was pretending to be Brianna, which would be consistent with this criterion, but before that she used multiple aliases. If somebody has dissociative fugue, they don't have multiple identities like this. They don't keep switching to a new person every few months or years. Each time they come out of a fugue state, they realize who they are again. They go back to their real identity until the next fugue state. None of these mental disorders would explain her behavior in the area of identity, and they also would not explain the staggering number of false accusations that she made. The most likely explanation is that Treva was being deceptive. I think what could have happened here is that Treva enjoyed being the center of attention. She wanted people to feel sorry for her, but also to be impressed by how she was a survivor of all these terrible and unlikely occurrences. She made up these fanciful tales about Satan worshippers chasing her after getting the idea from the satanic panic nonsense that was going on at the time. She could not succeed in a traditional sense, but she could be the most incredible victim. This is where she could shine. Treva was able to get away with these bad acts for so long due to the tendency of automatically believing someone making an accusation. Even if there's no evidence to convict the alleged offender, people will extend sympathy and resources to the victim. When bringing all the elements of this case together, here is a theory of Treva's motive. Just as some people enjoy the early stages of romance and no other part of it, Treva liked the early stages of sympathy for being a victim. The initial reaction from people when she told them her story was very satisfying. It's kind of like after people use heroin and they spend their entire lives trying to re-experience that first high. They're chasing that feeling that occurred right after they first used. If she always remained as Treva, there would be no way to continue to get that feeling again. So she kept changing her identity. She kept replaying the same story over and over. She was a teenager. She had a terrible history. Some person in a local community offended against her. Perhaps because she was getting too old to pass as a teenager, she selected one identity and tried to build a complete and fanciful tale of being a victim. So eventually she was forced to choose one. What lessons can we learn in this case? 
Shriva Throneberry's false accusations destroyed the lives of many innocent people. She was a tornado that tore through communities and caused devastation. Her behavior is a reminder that even though the theory of always believing accusers in the absence of proof originated with good intentions, it is illogical and reckless to do so. To believe a false accuser is to create another victim. People should believe evidence, not emotions. Those are my thoughts in the case of Treva Throneberry. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.